I am so happy to have the opportunity to be here with you this evening and to talk about a topic that I think is absolutely essential. There are so many difficulties that individuals deal with in this physical realm of existence. Mental health is one of them. It is a huge topic and one that concerns each and every one of us. It has been said that the global pandemic has impacted the mental health of many. As we look around at events occurring in our world today, we see divisiveness, war, oppression, sadness, death, continued surges of COVID-19 and other viruses. We can only assume that these struggles will exacerbate the mental health crisis that is being felt. We have to talk about these issues. We can't push them away and hide them in the shadows as was done for so many years. We also need to talk about mental health from a spiritual perspective, something that is uncommon. Typically, we leave this discussion to medical professionals or, or therapeutic professionals. But we need to talk about it from the perspective of wholeness, because we are whole beings, body, mind, and spirit. Therefore, talking about mental health from a spiritual perspective can provide us with awareness and understanding that we don't receive in other ways. If we look closely, we find that the ageless wisdom can provide a framework for us in understanding the difficulties and navigating the complexities of mental health issues. First, a little background about therapy and its role in a person's life. As a therapist and counselor educator for over 25 years, I've worked with many people ranging in age from toddlers to individuals in their mid 80s. Typically, Therapists refer to the people with whom they work as clients, not patients. Now, this may seem like a very small language difference, but there is a tremendous connotation in the difference between the two. The word patient implies that someone is ill or sick and needs an outside professional to provide services to fix the problem. On the other hand, the word client implies that the individual is simply using the services of a professional to address some obstacle or difficulty. Attorneys have clients, financial planners have clients, dietitians have clients, and so on. Many mental health professionals across the globe use the term client, as they perceive there is nothing wrong with the individual, but that he or she is simply addressing something in their life that is not working for them at that time. All of us run into difficulties and obstacles in our lives. It doesn't mean that we're sick. It means that we are human. It is the belief of most therapists that clients simply need some support in finding their own answers to whatever is not working. The therapist doesn't fix problems, nor does the therapist give advice. What the therapist does is to ask questions and provide maybe some insights so that the client can identify for themselves what is or is not working in their life and also find a solution 
to that difficulty. Thus, at the end of this portion of a person's journey, he or she has identified the obstacle and found their way through it. With the support of a professional who has full and complete confidence in that person's ability to manage their own life. It is a matter of walking with another person for a period of time and being a part of their journey forward. Doesn't this sound like the perception of the lives of human beings through the lens of spirituality, through the lens of theosophy? Each of us is on our own journey. As we move through our lifetime on the path of progressive development, we inevitably face difficulties and obstacles. Our task on this pilgrimage is to learn as we experience these situations so that we may grow in self-awareness and move forward in spiritual self-transformation. We are finding our way back to the knowledge of who we really are. We have been placed or we have placed ourselves in families and conditions that will provide us with the opportunities for growth, the greatest opportunities for growth and self-discovery. Each lifetime can be perceived as a period of time in a setting where we learn. Eventually, we return to our spiritual home only to return to a new setting when the time is right. When we perceive the obstacles in our path as opportunities for growth, it can make the situation more tenable. It doesn't solve the problem, nor does it erase the pain we might be experiencing does provide an understanding about why the obstacle has appeared in our path. We begin to look at the situation from a more universal or soul perspective rather than a personal one. So time for a couple of disclaimers. Due to this specific subject, there are a few things that need to be addressed. This is truly just a brief, brief discussion on a massive topic that frequently requires help from a professional. Our examination is not meant to be a therapeutic answer to specific problems or to provide solutions, but rather to shed light on a topic that impacts all of us. I'm not here to advocate counseling but be clear, I do advocate counseling and talking with a professional. Working on the obstacles in our path, whatever they may be, is generally painful from an emotional perspective. Some experiences are more painful than others. When dealing with these situations, we may experience a myriad of feelings. Feelings are a part of our physical existence. They are useful and helpful to us. They are a part of our evolutionary journey, and it is essential that we allow ourselves to feel our feelings. On the other hand, Allowing our feelings to overwhelm us for a long period of time is not helpful. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but I want to be clear that not only will we experience emotional pain, we must allow it. We must allow ourselves to feel our feelings and not close them off or push them away. 
And finally, some individuals are born with brain chemistry that is not balanced. That is, the brain doesn't make the appropriate chemicals to keep the emotions more balanced. In these cases, medication is most useful. I'm thinking here of diagnoses of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia and so on. It's not possible for a person who is struggling with an issue that is due to a brain chemical imbalance to just snap out of it. That's like saying a person with diabetes should just balance their sugar like that. It is a biological issue and needs to be addressed as such with a professional. So that having been said, let's look a little bit more deeply into the two issues that seem to be impacting many people today, depression and anxiety. Depression is a clinical diagnosis that can be potentially serious and is also common. Those who struggle with clinical depression typically experience persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. They lose interest in activities that they once enjoyed. Additionally, they may experience other symptoms such as significant weight gain or loss without trying, fatigue or lack of energy, feelings of worthlessness, sleep disruption, difficulty concentrating, and even thoughts of suicide. Anxiety can also be clinically diagnosed. And the symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder are very similar to those of clinical depression. However, with anxiety, a person is also likely to experience excessive worry and restlessness. Both of these, as I have said, are clinical diagnoses and must be diagnosed by a professional. Some individuals may need medication to address the symptoms and therapy to address the root cause. Today, tonight, we are talking about milder and more moderate cases of depression and anxiety, which may or may not require medication or therapy. Only the individual can determine the need for additional help. Our goal here is to look at mild or moderate depression and anxiety from a spiritual perspective and talk about ways that we can mitigate some of the symptoms. Again, this discussion is not meant to take the place of medical diagnosis, medication, or therapy. Have I said that enough? I think that I have, but it's very important that we are clear on this issue. So, let's begin by talking about feelings. Now, it seems strange that our topic is mental health, but we're focusing a great deal on feelings, not the mind, at least initially. This brings us back to the teachings of the ageless wisdom and the way it w in which it can help us understand and navigate these issues in a healthy and safer manner. When we think of feelings, we tend to think of emotions and possibly of the emotional field of consciousness, sometimes called the astral plane. When we think of mental, we tend to think of thoughts and the mental field of consciousness. Manas, as it is often referred to in theosophical or spiritual literature. When we talk about mental health, we're most likely referring to the concrete brain-mind, sometimes referred to, as I said, as manas. But that concrete brain-mind is frequently referred to as lower manas, as opposed to higher manas. When we talk about mental health, we're talking about 
lower manas, and its inner workings with the emotional field of consciousness. The inner workings of the concrete brain mind and the emotions is frequently referred to as kama manas in spiritual literature. Kama meaning desires, wishes, or feelings, and manas meaning mind or to think. We are referring to that mixture of thoughts and feelings that coalesce for want of a better word, that impact us as physical beings. Although we talk about the emotional field of consciousness and the mental field of consciousness as separate things, they're not. They are interpenetrating. And the reactions from these components of our consciousness occur almost simultaneously. For example, an individual experiences a tremendous disappointment on the physical plane of existence, whatever that could be. The emotional field is electrified, so to speak, and the emotions begin to swirl. Feelings of sadness or anger or frustration or whatever they are. And you can see this background behind this poor sad person. That is an attempt to show the swirling of the emotions. Then the thoughts begin to join the fray almost immediately. If I had only been smarter, if I had only been kinder, if I had only been whatever, I should have. I should have said this. I should have done that. I'm not good enough, I'm just not good enough. If I had only done, if I had only done, until finally we may get to a point where we're saying, my life isn't worth living. We know from our spiritual teachings, from our readings, from our study, that thoughts are things. So these thoughts begin to surround us. And soon, the feelings, the thoughts, they're all swirling. They're surrounding us and impacting us in ways that we're not really aware of. So the kama manas of this individual seems to be in control of the situation. And it continues, unless it's stopped. It can continue to the point of diagnosable depression or even thoughts of self-harm or suicide. Or, in another scenario, the individual may want to avoid or, or deny these feelings or these thoughts. And so the individual may choose to self-medicate in some way. As I said earlier, it is important to feel our feelings and not to shut them away or push them away. Shutting them out or pushing them away does not make them go away. It's like a volcano. The pressure, as we push it down, the pressure begins to increase and eventually the feelings are going to erupt. From my experience, they typically erupt at the worst possible time or in the worst possible place. Learning to express our feelings in a safe and appropriate manner is a part of our spiritual journey. However, it is equally important not to allow these feelings to overwhelm us for a long period of time. It is human to feel sad to feel angry, to feel frustrated, or whatever. It is also part of the spiritual journey to, at some point, 
begin to wonder why. Why was I so disappointed? What is it that I had hoped for or expected to happen? What can I learn from this situation so that I can respond differently in the future? All parts of our spiritual journey in relation to our thoughts and feelings. Am I making it sound simple? No, it's not, of course. It's easy to talk about, but it is not easy to do. Where is that balance between feeling the feelings and drowning in them? What does it mean to appropriately handle our feelings? When I worked with children, and this applies to adults as well, I would say to them, your feelings are all okay. It's okay to have those feelings and to feel them. But it is not okay to hurt yourself or someone else. And of course, we know that hurting ourselves or hurting others can happen in many ways not just by physical hurting, emotional hurting, saying things that hurt others. Some people may cry to express their feelings while others may journal their feelings. Some people may spend time in nature while others may choose to do some intense physical activity. The way in which a person handles his or her feelings is unique to each one of us. And as long as handling and expressing those feelings does not hurt us or someone else, then it's fine. For many, meditation or contemplation about the situation, the thoughts, and the feelings may be helpful. Self-observation in an honest and authentic manner can help. Sometimes it does require the help of a professional who can ask questions and facilitate honest and authentic self-observation. Then we have the opportunity to move forward, creating balance in our lives. Self-observation and self-awareness are key components for walking the spiritual path. They're not easy if we're honest and authentic and looking at those parts of ourselves that we're not always very proud of. But how can we move forward on the spiritual path if we don't have a continually deepening understanding of who we are. For an individual on the spiritual path, if we understand the swirling and controlling of the Kama Manas, then we are less likely to get caught up in it. We learn to regulate the Kama Manas, those emotions and feelings, and stop it from controlling us. Our self-understanding grows as does our ability to ameliorate the thoughts and feelings that held us in their grasp. It's time to be a little more specific, I think. Some years ago, a woman came to see me because she was experiencing anxiety about her son. He was in his 20s, and she felt that the life choices he was making were potentially harmful to him. I can't remember the choices he was making. I can only assume that they were the typical ones for a 20-something-year-old man who was trying to find himself and his way in the world. The mother, however, indicated that her anxiety was becoming such a problem that she had difficulty sleeping, concentrating, and focusing. She worried about him almost constantly, and it was impacting both her work and her relationship with her son. 
she felt him pull away from her as she tried to help him. And I put that in those air quotes because what she was really trying to do was manage his life, make his decisions, and protect him. The mother's background included being a single parent for many years, raising all three of her children, two girls and a boy, alone after the unexpected death of her husband. The woman was averse to using relaxation methods, including meditation. She said she couldn't keep the thoughts out of her mind, and she didn't really want to. Her perception was that as long as she was worried about her son, she was keeping him safe. An irrational thought, certainly, but it is a common one. Over a period of time, we talked about the woman's own journey to adulthood. We talked about the situations in her life when she learned the most and the times when she gained the most understanding of herself and others. We, we talked about her perception, about her current place in life and, and how she felt about it. Did she like herself? Was she happy with where she was? Did she feel like she had accomplished some of the things that she wanted to accomplish? And so on. This mother indicated that she had learned the most when she made mistakes or when she managed to overcome some hurdle in her life. She felt like she had grown tremendously as she worked through the grief over her husband's death. She also believed that being a single mother had made her stronger and wiser. When she looked at herself, she liked what she had learned and who she had become. In other words, we talked about her so that she could see herself, or at least her personality in, in this current lifetime, in a more complete and accurate manner. And so I finally asked her, if this is the way you feel about your journey, why would you want to deprive your son of these growth experiences too? Needless to say, this shocked her. And she began to think things through very differently. We talked in detail about the journey that each of us takes during our lifetime. The goal of our conversations, like this, were to share with her the concept of boundaries with others and respect for the individual journeys of others. Never mentioning reincarnation, we talked about the importance of an individual's own unique journey. I shared with her the poem by Khalil Gibran from his book, The Prophet, entitled On Children, where he says the following. And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, speak to us of children. And he said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children, as living arrows, are sent forth. 
the archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrows that fly, so he loves also the bow that is stable. We discussed the meaning of this poem in depth. At some point, this mother began to realize that her worries for her son were not helpful to him. Having him live the life she wanted was about her, not about him. She began to see her son as a unique individual, separate from her, although deeply loved by her, who was on his own journey to fulfillment. As she changed her thoughts, her feelings began to settle. Her anxiety dissipated. She began a new and different relationship with her son. It seems evident to me that the ageless wisdom teachings provide a framework for this particular situation. This wonderful woman had never stopped to look at herself, to see how her thoughts and feelings were swirling around her, causing her to feel anxious and worried. She didn't see herself for the strong, caring, independent person that she was. She never stopped to realize how she had grown through her life and the obstacles she had surmounted. Her self-awareness grew tremendously through this process. Furthermore, she realized that her selfishness, selfish but understandable attachment to her son was hurting him as well as their relationship. She came to think of him as a capable person who had experienced trials and tribulations in his life that would only make him stronger and wiser, just like her. She saw him on his journey, just as she was on hers. She began to trust the process of life and to let go of her useless and feeble attempts to control her son. It is not unusual for us as humans to try to control situations or even other people. Almost all of us can look to our beliefs and realize that not only is it impossible to control things, there is no need to do so. It only slows us down on our journey and keeps us from a true understanding of who we are. We can trust the process of life, regardless of what happens. Again, this probably sounds simplistic. It may be. I believe it's true, however. We know what can happen in the world. We know what can happen to those people that we love so much. But the ageless wisdom reminds us that Everything, everything and everyone that we encounter is a teacher to help us on our journey. So we return to the teachings of the ageless wisdom, including the concepts of reincarnation and karma. Why are we born into situations that expose us to difficult or traumatic experiences? We don't know, or at least most of us don't know. But from our studies, we do know that there is a purpose. We realize that the situation into which we are born will provide us with the best opportunities for growth on our journey, if we allow it. 
I had the opportunity to work with a young woman who was born into a family where the parents were alcoholics. The family experienced domestic violence between the parents and occasional physical abuse and neglect of the children. The impact of these experiences, while many years in the client's past, remained with her into adulthood. Some people may say, oh, that happened to you when you were a child. Uh, you're an adult now, so it shouldn't bother you. Just get over it. Well, that's not accurate. This trauma occurred at a young age. I'm sorry, this trauma incurred at a young age became a part of this person's emotional and mental fields. If not addressed, it will continue to come back, as it did with this young woman. She came to see me because she was having marital issues and feeling depressed. She described her husband as controlling. She said that he was a good father to their young children, but he would become angry at times over seemingly small situations. His anger frightened her. She believed that it was likely her fault that he was becoming so angry at times. She believed that she was not good enough, not a good enough wife, not a good enough mother, not a good enough housekeeper, not a good enough cook. And this is why he was becoming so angry. She wanted to remain married to him, mostly because she was afraid to be alone. Her goal was to fix herself so that she could improve her marriage and her husband wouldn't be angry anymore. Furthermore, she was experiencing symptoms of depression, feeling hopeless about her life and about her marriage, wanting to sleep all of the time and avoiding contact with friends. She indicated that she had been experiencing these symptoms for a few weeks and wanted to feel better. Well, this, of course, is a very complicated situation, and we're only going to focus on a few things uh, that seem to help with the resolution of the situation. Regarding the depressive symptoms from a professional perspective, I assessed her for suicidality, and found that was not currently an issue. We discussed certain things um, that she could do that would potentially um, decrease or alleviate some of the depressive symptoms that she was experiencing. And throughout our period of therapy, I kept a very close eye on her depressive symptoms and the potentiality of thoughts of suicide. During the therapy, we spent quite some time talking about her childhood background, her courtship with her husband, and their relationship to date. It quickly became clear that her early experiences were impacting the decisions and choices in her life today. She felt an innate sense of loneliness, describing the idea of being alone as terrifying. Her hypervigilance, that word, hypervigilance, which is typically caused by traumatic events, is the elevated state of continually assessing potential threats around us. Well, her hypervigilance led her to an awareness of the surfacing of her husband's anger. As she sensed the anger coming into being, she would quickly remove herself and the children from his presence. Her perspective was that if she didn't do so and do something to calm him down, violence would erupt and someone would be hurt, even though he had never been physically violent in any way. Clearly, the loneliness and hypervigilance, among other things, stemmed from her childhood experience. 
Furthermore, this young woman believed that all of the marital issues stemmed from her lack of everything. She wasn't lovable enough. She wasn't smart enough. She wasn't good enough, as I already indicated, and on and on and on. While it only takes a few minutes to describe this young woman's situation, the therapy involved took several years and involved layers upon layers of self-work on her part. For ease of discussion, I am simplifying and condensing not only the situation, but also the work that she did, only for ease of conversation. Through the course of the therapy, this young woman began to have a more clear understanding of herself. She was able to observe her behaviors and gain an awareness of their root cause. She began to see herself more clearly. It became evident to her that the terrified child who had experienced violence and chaos was still a part of her psyche. The trauma remained and needed to be addressed. It was this part of her that feared the anger and anticipated violence, as well as abandonment and being alone. Working to heal this residual trauma requires, from my perspective, working with the child component of the self. With this type of therapy, it's almost as if time folds in on itself so that we have the adult self and the child self in the same time frame. Typically, this is done through visualization, although other therapists may use other techniques for internal healing. Throughout this process, the client worked on helping her child self feel safe and loved. The work of self-observation and self-awareness through the reparenting of the inner child was essential in the healing process for this client. In conjunction with the healing of the child self, we also identified where the negative self-talk originated and how inaccurate that self-talk was. Children who live through traumatic experiences often blame themselves for the dysfunction of their families. They begin to inculcate negative messages that are not true. Messages such as, if I were only better at doing my homework, then my parents wouldn't fight. Or, I'm not lovable. Or, it's my fault that my parents are getting a divorce. Recognizing that these types of statements are not accurate and then changing them is also an essential part of the healing process. As you can imagine, we were working on both the emotional and lower mental aspects of her being. As she grew in self-awareness and understanding, she began to accept herself and see both her current situation and her childhood situation more clearly. She began to understand how her childhood experiences were carried into her adult life. She no longer blamed herself for the problems in her family of origin or for all of the marital issues. She began to regulate her emotions and her thoughts, stopping the negative and inaccurate thoughts and replacing them with positive and balanced thoughts that were accurate. When she felt the symptoms of depression begin to creep up, she was able to recognize them and take steps to alleviate them. In other words, she was able, for the most part, to balance her kama manas. She believed that the divine had a plan for her, even if she didn't understand it, and was committed to growing in self-awareness.
looking at a few of these basic concepts that are part of the ageless wisdom. Concepts such as the existence of various components of ourselves, emotional and mental, that we can learn to regulate and balance through understanding and effort. The recognition that obstacles and difficulties that occur in our path are teachers on our spiritual path. Self-observation and self-awareness are key components in our spiritual growth. If we look at these concepts, we can handle life's difficulties better. I probably need to rephrase that. It's not just looking at the concepts. It's, it's inculcating those, those concepts, believing them, moving forward in the knowledge that these concepts of the ageless wisdom exist. We're less likely to be subject to depression and our anxiety, unless, of course, there's a brain chemistry issue. This understanding facilitates our own spiritual development. As we work through the obstacles and issues on the physical plane of existence through this current lifetime, we heal. We heal this physical psyche. As we heal, we grow in self-awareness. We discard, or at least to some degree, the anxiety and depression that can become obstacles on our path. Whether that healing comes from working with a professional or through our own meditations and self-observations, we gain a new perspective. We grow in spiritual understanding. This perspective not only facilitates the improvement of our mental health in this lifetime, it supports our spiritual journey. As we heal, we don't lose who we are. Rather, we discover who we are. And this is at the core of our spiritual journey. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you and to share these thoughts. Take care and be well.